This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and sing about Jesus this morning. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name.
Thank you. I think I was blessed by that. How about you? Amen. And I know the Lord was. I know the Lord was. Well, it's good to have you all all here. Um, glad to see you today. I want to welcome those that are watching online and remind you about the different ways that you uh, can connect with us. You can uh, find our uh, websites. It's all right there, gsbcconnect.info slash I'm new. If you're new to the stream, you want to hit that and uh, kind of fill out the little card. Let us know you're watching and uh, any comments or anything you uh, would like to tell us, just uh, put that on there. Uh, there's also uh, rem reminding everyone that uh, if you're watching online and you want to want to give online, you can still uh, participate in the service that way. Um, there's a there's a give button at the bottom of all our websites. You can still um, text to give or, or mail mail your support. We are blessed as a church that during this uh, pandemic uh, we we've not uh, we've not suffered in, in the way many many churches had. And um, I want that's that's to give yourselves a hand for that. Um, that. Um, and the, the Lord, the Lord has really blessed us, and we, and we appreciate your faithful giving. Uh, and it's because of that that we're that we're still able to be here. You know, a lot of churches are are on the verge of closing right now. And uh, praise the Lord, we're still going strong. And to Him be the glory. But uh, but thanks to you as well. A um, couple of things we've got um, some big things coming up uh, on September 26th. Um, we will be uh, simulcast live streaming an event called The Return. And uh, Cameron, you have a video for that up there, um, for The Return. I don't know if you, if you have that, if, if, if not. Um, but anyway, uh, that's something that we want to take part in. We also got the 40 days of prayer and fasting uh, for the, for the up, upcoming election on November 3rd. Um, we're going to be doing that. Pastor's going to tell you some more about some of that. And... Um, but the other thing I want to mention before I go is um, on Wednesday nights we have resumed our Awana program and uh, had a good uh, had a good kickoff uh, uh, last week with with the registration and everything. But the first official night is this Wednesday. We are going to be um, adding classes for middle school and high school this year. It's the first time in a long time we've had that. Um, I've had a chance to look over the material for both the middle school and high school programs, and it looks amazing. Um, the middle school book, uh, their program is called Trek, and uh, the middle school book this year is called His Story. And it's basically a survey of the whole Bible from creation up until the ascension of Christ. And uh, you will uh, memorize scripture, and you will learn um, how to take these facts of history and what they mean to your life because it's truly his story. For the high school class, they're doing something called Advocates, which is, at, in looking at it, it looks like almost like a college-level apologetics course, a course on how to, de how to know what you believe and how to defend it. Uh, if, if you've got uh, kids of any age, I highly recommend that they take part in the Iwana program, but this is the first time in a while we've had it for the high school, so I just want to let everybody know middle school and high school have got an awesome opportunity uh, to take play, take part in the Iwana program. And Pastor Freddie, uh, I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? It almost encourages a comment. What do they live? God shows. He chose us to live. In such a day as this. This year 2020 has been more than amazing. And that's not necessarily in a breathtaking way, but it is. When the world suffers from a pandemic, an election year that is totally upside down, our country is on the verge of being redefined, and we must be people that honor God and as we honor God God I believe will honor our country and uh, that's the burden for the 40 days and I think we've got this video and uh, if we if we don't I see Cameron we got it so let's watch this a, it's a minute video on what's going to happen this weekend that defies explanation okay. this is Jonathan Kahn 
We are standing at a critical moment in American and world history, a moment that can seal the future for calamity or redemption. We've driven God out of our culture, and now we war against his ways. If we don't return to God, America's light will go out. The answer is revival, but we only have a limited window of time. So this is the announcing of the return, the national and global day of prayer and repentance. Saturday, September 26, 2020. Join me for a prophetic and critical gathering on the National Mall, Washington, D.C. If you can't make it, the return will be all over America. Gather in your states, your churches, your homes to pray for repentance, return, and revival. And surrounding the day of return will be 10 days of prayer and repentance, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur. Plan now. The return, September 26, 2020. Spread the word in this video and go to the returnwebsite.org. That's the returnwebsite.org. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to return. See the participants who will be involved in this meeting on Saturday. And then understand that it's going to be not just an event that takes place in America. This is going global. It's worldwide. You go to the website, you can begin to see the different locations around the world where men are going to be gathering and, and, and families and, and, and praying. And I say men collectively, praying for a return. We need to return to God. And we fix that, we'll be fixed. But that Saturday, here at our church, we have a schedule. We will be hosting a simulcast that will begin at noon and go to 3 o'clock. And uh, there's a good bit of information out in the foyer that you can take home with you. Some of this maybe you have already received, but uh, here's a handbill, uh, 40 Days of Fasting, which uh, Dr. Towns is going to be speaking on this morning. And we're going to begin that event for us here on Friday, but the return September 26th, which will be next Saturday. And then also, uh, Franklin Graham is hosting at the same time and in conjunction with uh, the uh, uh, Pray 20, March 20. And that's going to take place at noon to 2 o'clock, starts at the Lincoln Memorial. And it's an RSVP prayer march dot com. You can you can get information there concerning uh, those. I mean, I never. It's almost unimaginable in our day with the quarantine and all that we've got going on that an event, one of these events, would be planned. This is major. Uh, I know some of the speakers at the return. I printed them out, and uh, James Dobson who has retired from, from, from his radio program, still is a speaker. He, he uh, Ann Lotz, I mean, you name it, and just about everybody who represents our Savior in ministry here in the U.S., from pastors all the way through, are going to be speaking. This event on the return begins at 9 o'clock in the morning. It goes to 9 o'clock on Saturday night. And um, that's just, just the one event. And then you've got Franklin Graham's event. And then I understand there's some others. You tell me a time in our history when you can, you can identify a time that this much, this much is being dedicated to a day, of, a day of prayer and then to launch 40 days of prayer. Go back in your memory bank and tell me when there's been an event that would draw this number of people, not just to Washington, but then to simulcast. There are eight churches here in Myrtle Beach that will be receiving simulcast that starts at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. It goes to 9 o'clock on Saturday night, the 26th. We're hosting the 12 to 3 o'clock hour. And, and to, to get this much done, that's just in Myrtle Beach. That doesn't count the cities throughout the country. Billboards have been erected. TV ads have been purchased. It's an amazing time to live and be a witness to it. And so I encourage your participation, and uh, you'll be certainly challenged by Dr. Towns this morning in the message. And then if you did not, at the welcome table, or I'll get, had to get more information, there's uh, a handout. It's a special prayer request. And uh, these are names that we've been given to be prayed over here in our church family during these next 40 days. If you have not made the list and you want to put somebody on the list, 
if you will get that information to, to Lois Clarity, uh, then we will put an amendment out so folks can receive it and, and to pray, certainly during this time of sickness and uh, all the other challenges that we have. And then here's a, uh, these, this, this syllabus is also available. Uh, I, I think we've got enough for all. But anyway, uh, that's 40 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, and that also will be available at the end of the service. And you should have gotten the little outline uh, this morning when you came in. So that covers, that covers two items. And then if you were here Wednesday night or if you watched the web stream Wednesday night and you saw the presentation Award, the awards that were presented to our, our Awana kids. And if you were not impressed, oh boy, you need to work on your impressor. I, it's more than amazing to me what uh, Awana has meant in the lives of so many. And uh, it's, it's not a program that was just developed yesterday. It's been around. It's time-tested generations have been involved. In fact, I saw Lisa in the foyer, and she's probably the oldest participant. But Lisa, how many years have you been working with Awana and been involved with Awana? 29, 29 years. Did you hear that? <laughs> and, and some of the youth, I mean, the Deets kids, the scriptures, they memorized books that they completed uh, during, during this interrupted year of Awana with the quarantine and other problems we ran into. It is the single best investment a parent can make in his or her children. The scriptures teach us that if we hide the word of God in our heart, we will not sin against him. And the straying isn't for a lifetime. The prodigal found his way home because he knew his father. And he knew how his father took care of the hired help. And he sought the grace and blessings of his father. So he said, I will arise. That's repentance. And I will go to my father. He had that knowledge in his heart. So pray along with the 40 days. Pray for our kids. They pay the highest price. Someone did a survey. And it is astoundingly embarrassing the lack of knowledge that our youth have been taught on things like the Holocaust. Only about a third believe or know and understand there was a holocaust. Six million Jews perished in Germany in not too many decades ago. And our kids don't even know it. They're anti-Semitic, not even knowing who and why God's chosen people have been persecuted and six million perished in the ovens. In, in Germany. And so we need to pray for our youth, pray for our kids, pray for our church, and pray for our nation. And not just church, but churches as we move forward and come out of this time that we now know to be uh, a pandemic. So we, we thank the Lord for his blessings. We thank the Lord for your participation. And uh, I think that covers most of the uh, and now, oh, next Sunday, too, we'll have communion. So uh, I wanted to get that before you. And then we also have the copies of Dr. Sound's devotional prayer guide, which will be available at the end. And you'll hear more about that then. We're going to do something just a little different this morning. And, and sometimes change is good, and sometimes change is, is not. But we want to do... I had uh, Cleve Minch, he's an organist, so... We had the organ, and we hadn't used it. And I was concerned about going into the invitation and having a lot going on. It seems like nearly every Sunday for the last several, we've had two or three things happening at the end of the service. 
And so uh, I've decided that we needed a time of reflection. And that's just to stop long enough on a Sunday morning and thank God for His grace. Has God blessed you this week? I looked at our prayer list, and we do want to continue praying for Ken Kuhn. He's undergoing the new treatment. And then also others had surgery this week. Others had doctor's appointments this week. And, and the list is lengthy. But God's answered prayer. Uh, he, he gave us a miracle, and, and uh, uh, it, it's after a miracle. And so we thank him for that. And so we want to invite you, Cleve's going to play softly. I want us to bow our heads as we have a time of just reflection. And I want you, in your own way, to speak from your heart and thank God for blessing you this week. Would you bow with me, please? And Cleve, would you lead us? Stand, please. Would everyone please stand? And at this time, we're going to have prayer, and we're going to ask God to bless the offering, and we're going to invite you to bring your offerings this morning at this time. And uh, Cle Cleve will continue to pray play for us softly. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, love. Well, you are love. You gave your son to die for us. So we've never been loved by anyone as you have loved us. You've given us the greatest country in the world to live in. You have, you've blessed us with the prosperity that we enjoy. And those throughout the world want to come to America to capture the dream that they see here. Lord, we call on you today and ask you to bless America and bless us that we might be a faithful steward of that that you've given us, how you've prospered us. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll bless our tithes and offerings this morning and our love gifts and we bring these as just a small token of our gratitude, our praise, and our worship. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So.
Amen. I was struggling for words. I'm going to introduce Dr. Towns while I'm up. And um, to say that he's a giant, many people think about physical giants, but what he's done in the kingdom, what he's done in the building up of our kingdom, is amazing. The books he's written, the uh, lives he's touched, family on the front row, is in his Sunday school class in Lynchburg. And they were in Myrtle Beach the weekend, heard he was here, and so they came to be here. A giant. If Mickey Mantle were in town, I'm sure that those of you who grew up in his era would say, I'd love to have his autograph. Sports have their heroes. But God's got a hall of fame in heaven, I believe. For those who have faithfully served him. And Dr. Towns is a leader in that pack. In the 20th century, 21st century, the lives he's impacted by his books, his teachings, and all that he's done. So we're going to have our special music, and after the special music, Dr. Towns is going to come, and he's going to share with you a message that he has only one motive for delivering. He knows it works, and it's the passion of his heart. Here's a man that's truly a modern prayer warrior, and we're thankful that he's a part of the service. So we'll have the special in Dr. Towns. Oh, 
gonna say goodbye exact date but I got an email on a I think on a Monday and it was from Dr. Towns and in that email he said pastor I prayed for you Saturday and told me I was on his Saturday prayer list and of all the preachers that this man would know all the missionaries this man would know all the members at Lynchburg I pray for you and the church and the church amen Give him a hand of welcome. Would you bless you, Dr. Tim? I first visited Myrtle Beach in 1938. Was anybody there <laughs> when I came? My mother brought me here, and I was six years old. Now figure out how old I am. I'll be 88 years old next month. I came back the second time. In 1970, uh, it was in February, and there was an ice storm, and the whole city was shut down. There was no electricity. Uh, we were saying there were about 10 uh, leaders here from the Pentecostal Holiness Church at a motel down on Lakefront, uh, Oceanfront, and um, we were sleeping in a cold room, and we met in a room with um, artificial light, and I, didn't, I couldn't use my PowerPoint. And I spoke to the Pentecostal holiness. I said, this denomination can change. They had a rule that every pastor had to move every three years. Every three years, because that was John Wesley's plan. And many, have, I said, that's hurting you. And here's what will take to grow. I said, let me tell you about some other churches that have grown. And I had just done a book on the 10 largest churches in the world. They listened, they voted. There was a man there that day. He said, I'm going to be one of the first to grow. He went back to Fayetteville, built a church of about uh, 3,000 people. And the Pentecostal holders have grown because a church is built on the vision, heart, and passion of a leader. And so because a man could stay his lifetime, he could build a lifetime. Jerry Falwell spent his life in one church and built one of the greatest churches in America. I learned many things from Jerry Falwell, and one thing I learned was fasting. The first year we began the college, uh, Jerry said, I'm going to ask everyone to fast with me. It was a Yom Kippur fast. It was a one-day fast. He said, I'm going to ask you to fast. We're going to fast from, I got this, let me see if this works. Fasting and prayer. Yom Kippur. Every year on the 10th day of the 7th month, September, you are to fast and not work. On this day, a substitute payment for your sins will be made in the Lord's presence. The first time the word fasting is mentioned in the Bible, this is it. God says on, on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, you must fast. And so I, I learned fasting from Jerry Falwell. He said, we're going to fast one hour, one day. He said, I want everyone to fast on Sunday night. By the way, Falwell always called a fast on Monday because he said, I can talk to you, I can challenge you, give you the vision, and you can eat Sunday noon, but you don't eat Sunday night. You don't eat breakfast, you don't eat lunch. And when the sun goes down on Monday, you can eat again. And so uh, I learned, if I fast that first time. I said, boy, I can't make it. I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach that day. And I kept saying, oh, God, help me make it through. Help. I didn't eat. I didn't eat dinner. I didn't eat breakfast. I said, oh, God, I don't want to fast. And I, made it. I said, thank you, God. I made it through. 
The only thing I learned from the first fast is it was easy. <laughs> I, didn't really, I, I didn't really pray for what Jerry was praying for. I learned to fast and pray from Jerry Falwell. And so we fasted on several occasions. I can remember when Charles Hughes, one of our brightest, powerful preachers, he preached in the biggest churches of America. He was on a trip. A four, four of our boys, a quartet, was going up into Pennsylvania to preach. An 18-wheeler came down through the ice, hit him, bang. His head was smashed. They took him to a hospital. They called Jerry. Jerry went over to the hospital, right outside of Lancaster, PA. He walked in. The doctor says um, uh, he had his, the boy's father with him. And he says, uh, the boy is not going to make it. He's good as dead. He says, um, could you sign the papers? He said, sign the papers. We'd like to take his organs and uh, donate his heart, donate his liver, donate everything to him to help other people. And the Lord said, no. And I can remember that father running down the hallway. He said, I, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And Jerry came home that night. He stood, it was a Wednesday. He stood in prayer and he said, Charles is supposed to die. But he said, we're going to fast starting now. If you haven't had Wednesday night supper, don't eat. Don't eat breakfast, don't eat lunch. We're going to pray, and God's going to raise him up. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, that's bigger than I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, his, head, his brain was swelling. They took the top of his head off and left it off for 13 days so the brain could swell and go back in. And they put the top of his head back on and sewed him back in. And uh, Jerry said, we're going to fast and pray. I can remember sitting on the platform with Jerry. I'm sitting here, he's sitting there. And we knelt down to pray, as we always do. And Jerry said, Lord, he said, save Charles. I want a miracle, God. I want the biggest miracle I've ever had. And I'd say, oh, Lord, I think you can do it. You've done it before, but Lord, I don't have faith. I believe, help my unbelief. Anyway, I want to tell you something. On graduation day that year, Jerry said, I so believe that Charles is going to be raised up. I want to make an announcement. He's going to be our speaker this year at graduation. I said, oh, my goodness. We've had the biggest names. We had Criswell, the biggest pastors in America, the biggest politicians. We're going to get a sophomore to preach? Yeah, and I thought, that's not right. And so I was there on graduation day. I, at the time, I was also the editor of the newspaper, so I had a camera. I was going to go out and take pictures. And Charles was sitting there in the back room, and he was there, and he started taking off these bandages. He had all kind of bandages around. He took them off, and he was ugly. I mean, you look at him, it was red and blue and stitches all around his head. His hair was going back in. Uh, he was pretty with bandages on. He said, I want him to see who I really am. They got up and preached. Now, folks, I want you to know, I was out there with a camera. And I said, something wrong. I couldn't, I couldn't get the, the, the lens to focus. I said, it's raining. It must be the rain. No, it's not the rain. The rain was in my, I was crying. I was crying because Charles was up there. And I heard him preach. I want you to know, folks, he did a terrible job. He never really, he was one of the brilliant students preached in some of the biggest churches, came back, brilliant mind. He went on to get his BA, MA, MDiv, doctor's degree, but his speech never really came back. He'd get up and he'd preach, and he'd preach, and then it, all of a sudden his words would slur, and he would repeat himself. He had a brilliant mind, but he couldn't quite preach. And so, you know, Charles is still alive today. He's still at liberty. He got a job. He runs our prayer room. He runs our prayer room. Folks, God answers prayer. Amen. God answers prayer. Right now, America is in trouble. I don't know if you still read the, if you see the same things I see on television. I see people hate America. I see people hate one another. I see hate like everything. 
Jesus would not have you hate anyone. I see people hate America, and I think if some of these people win, we're going to lose America. I'm going to ask you today at the end of this sermon to fast for 40 days. Not about Trump. It's not about Trump. It's about saving America. Folks, we're facing a crisis. Now, some of you don't understand a crisis. I was a little boy, and I remember at night when the sirens would go off, mother would take me into the corner of the living room and put pillows around us. We lived not too far from the shipyard, and we were always afraid if they bombed the shipyard, they'll get our house. And so we got in the pill. We, I would sit there cowering in fear at night because the Germans were going to bomb Savannah, Georgia, my home. I understand fear. Now, folks, I fear today. I fear we're in a battle, not a military battle. We're in a battle to save the soul of America. Amen. The soul of America and the soul of churches. And so I'm going to challenge you at the end of this sermon today. We need to fast and pray for God to do a miracle. Four years ago, I was invited to come to a banquet. The night before Trump was elected, I didn't really think that Trump was going to make it. I didn't think that Trump was going to make it. But the night before he was elected, about five blocks from the White House is the Hilton. And the Hilton Ballroom that night was rented by about a thousand Pentecostal preachers. And they gave me tickets. The tickets were $5,000 a plate. So they gave me two tickets. And I went there. We started at 6.15. And they said, we're going to have a dance at 11 o'clock. <laughs> at 11 o'clock, we didn't dance. We prayed. But these Pentecostal preachers, one after another, stood up and said how they had fasted and prayed to put... Trump in office. There were 21 of them. They gathered, made an appointment to go to his office in New York, in Trump Tower. They went up, they were there, and uh, three or four of them are my personal friends. And so they anointed him with oil. They had put their hands on, they prayed on him. They had an agreement. They were not going to speak in tongues. One man spoke in tongues. The other man did not rebuke him. But afterwards, they said, you can't come back. So they did not invite him back because they said, that's an embarrassment to us. And so they prayed over Trump. That's before the election, the last election. And then I heard him give testimonies of how they fasted, how they prayed for God to do something in America. And God answered. That night, I sat there from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock, testimony after testimony. Verse after verse, all night long we heard, and I wept, and I wept. People praying for God to do something in America. God has to do something, and he did something big back then. Now, folks, Trump came to liberty. That's about, um, let me see if I can remember how many years ago it was. The first time he came to liberty, I used to sit on the platform. And so we're in the green room waiting to go in, and... Um, he says to Jerry, he says, Jerry, he says, I want you to support me for I'm going, I'm going to make a run for the president. And I said, now before, uh, I'm born, I said, before you, you support it, I'm going to ask you some questions. Can I ask you? He said, sure. I said, are you born again? He said, let me tell you something. When I was 12 years old, I joined a Presbyterian church in Brooklyn, New York. The preacher asked me, do you know Jesus is your Savior? He said, I said, yes, <laughs> nothing's changed. He says, uh, how do you know you're saved? He said, because I asked Jesus in my heart. And I said, uh, that day, I asked Jesus in my heart. And he says, uh, you're going to commit yourself to follow him? I said, yes. And he said, uh, nothing's changed. He said, if you want to check me out, he says, check my, my sons out. He said, I don't drink, they don't drink. I said, wait a minute. I saw you one day drinking wine. He said, none of my sons ever get drunk. They're not inebriated. They don't drink. They drink wine. I drink wine. Jesus drank wine. I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know how to take that. And I said, um, and one more thing. You cuss. And he said something. I said, you say that I don't use the word. I don't use the D word because that's cussing to me. I don't use the H word. I would not 
since I had H because that's cussing to me. And he said, sure, I say. He said the D word. He said the H word. But he said, I don't take God's name in vain. He said, that, he said the Ten Commandments said, don't take his name in vain. It doesn't mention D and H. This is, this is Trump talking to me. He said, I don't cuss. My sons don't cuss. Judge me by my sons. Boy, could you be judged by your children? Would you like to be judged by your children and how they walk with God? Judge me by my sons. He said, they're in church, and they give to God, and I give to God. Now, folks, Trump is not a good man. I mean, Trump is not a perfect man, but he's God's man for the job. And so I'm going to ask you to fast and pray for the election, not for Trump, for America. You understand what I'm asking you to do? Let's fast and pray for America. Jerry Falwell taught me to fast. I've been on a 40-day fast. I had a glass of orange juice in the morning, a glass of V8 juice at night. That's all I had for 40 days. You said, why that? Basically for one reason. The juice keeps your inner system working. And so that uh, if you don't have enough water and juice in you, your system gets blocked up. And so I went for 40 days without eating. I lost about 30, 40 pounds. And I've been, I've been 40 days on a Daniel fast. Daniel fasted and ate only vegetables. Boy, that was hard. I said, never again will I do this. If I ever fast again, I'll not fast a veg. I will fast a juice fast. Or I'm going to begin fasting on Friday of this week for 40 days. And 40 days after Friday will end up November the 3rd, the election day. I'm fasting for America. I'm going to ask you to join me. Some of you are going to begin on Wednesday. If you fast 40 days beginning on Wednesday, you'll end up on the Sunday before election. Some are going to fast those 40 days. I'm going to ask you to do something you've never done before. I'm going to ask you to fast. But folks, it's not about giving up. It's about spending the time of eating in prayer. So instead of eating breakfast, kneel down and pray. Ask God. God bless America. God save America. Why, why must God save America? For you? Why must God save America? For what we can do for the world. Now, America used to be the light of the world. But in the last 20 years, we've seen there are more missionaries being sent out from Korea than the United States. That's pretty bad. There's more missionaries being sent out from Africa the United States. There's a church in Nigeria. I was there four years ago. Didn't go to the church. I was going to the Baptist in Nigeria. We're driving down this expressway, and here is this call Redeemer Cap. And so this, they got a church there that run 50,000 people on Sunday morning. They got an auditorial seat, 50,000. Doesn't have air conditioning, has holes in the ceiling. Well, they can seat 50,000. He said, Boy, that's a big one. I drove down the street, I looked at it, all of a sudden I saw big, heavy industry, steel mills, light industry, factories, apartments, condos, individual houses, shopping center, all owned by one church. This one church, once a, once a month, they have, one, it's called the Church of Redeemer of uh, Church of the Redeemer of God. It's a Pentecostal, capital P Pentecostal. And so once a month, they have um, Holy Ghost Night, and they invite others to come to it, and they have about a million people there. I should have brought a picture to show you of a million people in prayer meeting praying for God. I've got a photograph of it, and I show that. Now, once a year, they have the Holy Ghost Conference, and for seven days, uh, they ask people to come from all over all the churches of Ni Nigeria to come in. They have seven to eight million people to come and sit. Now, folks, I'm a Baptist. I don't pray in tongues. But I love people who love Jesus. I'm a fundamentalist. If you're a fundamentalist and you believe in the fundamentals of the faith, you're with me. I'm a fundamentalist. I'm a Baptist who believes in Jesus. But, folks, if a, I love Presbyterians. They don't baptize right. But if you love Jesus, I love Presbyterians. Folks, uh, God's doing something in the world today. 
and we're asking God to do something again in the world. Around the world, they're doing much, but in America, we need to do something. Now, Jesus fasted. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and nights, he was hungry. I fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and I was not hungry. I remember after having fasted for 40 days, I went to a redneck restaurant in Lynchburg, Virginia. I love redneck restaurants, but they have my kind of food. And so I go there, and I, they, they have fresh vegetables. They, they bring in fresh vegetables and cook them, and that's the way I like my vegetables. I like them to be fresh cooked, not out of a can. And so I was at Bill's, and my wife was with me, and I sat in the back room, and I looked out the window, and I watched the sun go down. And as the sun went down past the horizon, it was now Sunday. I had fasted before. I said, I called later. I said, okay, uh, I want, and I ordered a couple of things. I said, I want something very light. I ordered just a couple of things, and I ate for the first time in 40 days. I was not hungry. Jesus hungered. Now, when Jesus fasted, he did not fast water. He fasted food. There's another verse that says he fasted from food, not from water. Fasting was taught by Jesus. When you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. This is a Sermon on the Mount. When you fast, comb your hair. Wash your face. Why? Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father who knows what you do in fast. Notice the word. He didn't say, if you fast. He didn't say, if you fast. What word did he say? When. Folks, when you fast. Have you fasted ever before God? Have you ever given up one day of food for God? What are you going to do for God? Now, I, I'll tell, some of you ought to, for 40 days, give up one meal a day. One meal a day. Give up breakfast, give up lunch, give up dinner. One meal a day and spend that time in prayer. Some of you give up two meals a day. And so you don't eat breakfast, you don't eat dinner, you eat lunch. One meal a day and spend the time in prayer. Jesus said, when you fast, when you fast, he, said, he assumed you were going to fast. Church fasting. As these men were worshiping the Lord, this is Acts chapter 13. As these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul, that's Paul, the Apostle Paul, for the special missionary work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them away. The first missionary started out. They left uh, the Holy Land. They went out. They left Israel. They left uh, Antioch. And they went to Tur they went to Cyprus and to Turkey and then to Greece and finally Rome. And they came, they sent the missionaries west towards America because they were fasting. So you ought to fast. Introduction to fasting. Christian fasting is a non-required, you don't have to do it, but you want to do it. So I'm going to ask you, starting Wednesday or starting Friday, for 40 days, commit yourself to save America. One meal a day, two meals a day, or three meals a day, and maybe you're going to go juice or whatever. Whatever God tells you to do, it alters your diet eliminates food and or drink. It's for a biblical purpose. You are fasting for God to do something, not to lose weight. It's not about losing weight, but it's a comp but if you just fasting is not going to get you anything with God. It doesn't get results. Prayer. I believe in prayer. God can answer prayer. Kinds of fasts. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom is day Kippur, the day of atonement. Now, in the book of uh, Leviticus, uh, on the tenth day of the seventh month in each year, you must go without eating to show your sorrow for sins. When it comes to the Day of Atonement, I read in the scriptures where Adam, the blood of a lamb for one man, Adam brought a lamb. And then it was one lamb, a lamb for the nation. And then there was a lamb for the world. And so the Day of Atonement was a lamb for the nation. God says, on the seventh day, or on the tenth day of the seventh month, take a lamb and go in 
and sacrifice for all of Israel. I used to say, God, if all if the, if he sacrificed one lamb, would there not be some Jews out there who would be marginal, backslidden, not good Jews? Is that, is that blood, is that lamb going to cover that? What does that lamb cover? And then I began to read how God says, on that day, you must identify. If you wanted the blood to cover you, you had to fast for the blood to cover you. And so it's called the Yom Kippur fast. <clears throat> I fast quite often on a Monday. I don't eat Sunday night. I don't eat breakfast on Monday. I don't eat lunch on Monday. When the sun goes down, I, I eat, but I wait till the sun goes down. Why? Because a day is measured in Genesis chapter 1. God measures the day. The evening and the morning were the first. So God measures the day from the time the sun goes down to the time the sun goes down. And so um, Yom Kippur, a normal fast is going without food for a certain period of time. Drinking only liquids, water, or juice. Um... One of my close friends is the pastor of the world's largest church, Youngie Cho. I first met him way back in the early 70s when he was only running 75,000 in his church. And I preached in that first church for him. And um, we would meet together and we would talk together. He said, I said, Dr. Cho, I want to learn how to be more godly from you. He said, Dr. Downs, I want to learn church growth, everything about growing churches from you. And so he taught me that he would fast. And he said, I fast because I touch, the, I touch the hem of the garment. I touch God himself. And I get my prayers answered. So the first time I prayed, his church only would seat about 8,000. And I preached for him. Uh, but I forgot, I'll tell this funny story. I had, had an appointment with him on a Wednesday night from five to six. And I was in his office and we had been talking, I'm writing, writing down. And after about six o'clock, he says, it's time to go preach. And we walked over to the door. He had two doors to his office. One door went to the hallway. The other door, he opened up and good night. I looked out, there's 8,000 people there. So he walked out, he says, um, you're gonna preach tonight. He said, I'm gonna walk out, I'm gonna pray. And I'm gonna ask God to give you a message and I'll, I'll announce what you're gonna preach on. And I said, okay. So he, we went out and we knelt down. He began to pray. I began to say, oh God, help him to choose something I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said, I'll get up. And I, so he, he called a verse and I preached on oh, that verse. And I, and I remember I said, uh, let me talk about that verse. And, I, and so I preached on a verse I had already preached before. It was a great privilege to preach. I went back and preached the second time when his auditorium was running about 12,000. Now, he has, multi, he has seven or eight worship services every Sunday morning. But he has about 25 multi-site services around the world. It was the largest church in the world. And so, um, how does he fast? He fasts many different ways. The Daniel fast. I have a whole book called the Daniel. By the way, I had some books out there. I brought some books with me. I didn't know which one. I just had them in the trunk of the car. And I put them out. And I, I usually sell my books, but I'm going to give them away free if, before you pick a book up, you have to promise to read it. So uh, you can have it free, but you have to promise not to read it all, you have to read it halfway through. So I'll beat you halfway. So you have to read, so pick up a book and look at it. If you don't want to read it, don't take it. But if you're going to take it, that's a promise between not me and you, between you and God, that you'll read half of it. And there are four of them there, and they, it costs anywhere from 10 to $20, but you can have them free today, and you take those books and you leave today. An absolute fast. No water, no food. Never go without water more than three days. The body is somewhere between 70 and 90% water, depending on how old you are and how you've trained yourself. And if you don't have water to replenish yourself, you die. And um, I read about a friend who went 13 days without water. He lost full consciousness. They couldn't bring him back. He eventually died after about 17 or 18 days. Don't try going without water. Just fast. A partial fast, omitting certain foods on a schedule of limited eating. So 
only one meal a day or two meals a day or at this place we can talk about the da- the da- Daniel Daniel said I didn't eat anything but kosher vegetables and so you go you see that in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel uh, chapter 10 he o- he had fasted twice only eating kosher vegetables and so uh, I tried that. I don't like that. I'd rather go without eating at all. John Wesley changed the world. John Wesley began the Methodist Church, and he and the Holy Club would fast. And when they would fast, the John Wesley fast, they would eat only bread and water for seven days. And John Wesley sent people out. When John Wesley um, began this movement called the Wesley Church, uh, or we call it the Methodist Church. It was a small movement. When America was founded in 1776, there were 243 Methodist churches that year. By the year uh, uh, 1812, or the War of 1812, there were 5,000 Methodist churches. They exploded without, like no other church in history exploded. John Wesley, because the people fasted and prayed, And when they came to conference for three days every month, they would eat only bread and water and put put God's word for, and they'd pray and ask God to use them in a great way. The the rotation fast, also called a Mayo Clinic fast. Mayo Clinic would say, we put you on a certain fast to find out what you're allergic to. What makes you sick? What makes you unhealthy? And therefore, they would give you one, they would just give you one of the different uh, food families each. The supernatural fast. Moses went 40 days without eating and drinking. You can't do that without a miracle. And God did a miracle for Moses. So don't try a supernatural fast. The fast of Scripture. Let's talk about the fast. What does the Bible say about fast? I'm going to look at Scripture, and the Scripture, I'm going to go all the way through. Isaiah 58. More about fasting in Isaiah 58 than any other passage in the Bible. So let's learn from that passage. Let's go back. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, God says. God says, I have chosen a fast. He's going to tell you nine things that you should do. Number one, to loose the bonds of wickedness. Now, that has the idea of handcuffs. That has the idea of shackles. Some people are shackled by cussing. They can't break it. At Elam Home, Lunsburg, Virginia, we have a home for alcoholics. And quite often I'm over there and I'll deal with people at the altar, Thomas Road. And one of those men come in, Dr. Towns, I just can't quit. I just can't quit. I said, all right, we need to talk about a fast. Putting God first. You give up eating and putting God first and let's break that addiction. And so of all the, the, of all the humanitarian organizations dealing with addiction, our home, Elam Home, has one of the ba- best records of breaking alcoholism among people. One of the re- we do it spiritually, not with medicine. We do it spiritually and let God do the thing. The first fast to break addiction. What is your addiction? If you have an addiction that you cannot break, God can break it to loose the bonds of wickedness. Number two, to solve problems, to undo heaven. What burden do you have today? I think in terms of a heavy burden, a problem that's bothering you. Um, I go back to, we built seven dorms. And we were trying to build Liberty University. And we built seven dorms up there, and we were in debt. And as I think in terms of that early dormitory, these dorms were up there. They were built. They had, in those days, they had yellow brick on outside. They had the tops on. But the insides were empty. We ran out of money. And they sat there a year. We just ran out of money, and there was no money. And Jerry called a fast. He said, let's pray and ask God to do a miracle for us. And he asked God for a $5 million million miracle. I've never heard of a $5 million miracle. And they said, all right, today in chapel. We came to chapel. He said, today, we're going to cancel chapel. If you guys... Want to go out and get yourself to eat? Or get your cold drink, get a cup of coffee? Go ahead. But if you want to change the world, follow me. I'm going to jump off this platform. I'm going to walk out that door. I'm going to walk over to those. I'm going to walk all the way around the building one time. 
and we'll kneel down in groups of about seven or eight each and pray and ask God for $5 million and commit ourselves starting tonight to not eat. We're going to fast for one day for God to do a miracle. Jerry jumped off the platform. I'm with him. We, go, we walk out there. We walk up, and then all, almost all the students go with us. We walk around those seven buildings, and I can take you to the spot where I knelt. And being bold, I prayed first, Lord, $5 million is more money than I've ever prayed. Boy, that's a lot of money, $5 million. We've never seen anything like that before, Lord. I believe you can do it. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Somebody else prayed, somebody else prayed. Then Jerry, Lord, you got a lot of money and I need some of it. <laughs> that was the way, Lord, you got a lot of money and I need some of it. Lord, five million is nothing to you. And so, Lord, we're going to start next week. That building hasn't been built. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to tell the contractors, come back in, put the equipment back in, we start the work. At the end of the week, Lord, they're going to paycheck. So, Lord, I don't need all five million, but I need enough money to pay them next week. And the next week, he said, Lord, we can finish this project. And I think he, he told us how many, 36 weeks. We can finish this project in 36 weeks, but Lord, keep it coming. And we started, and the money came, and we finished it, and we jumped the next year. We jumped by 3,000 more students because we had those dormitories ready for the students. It's not about money, it's not about building, it's about students reaching the world for Christ. And so I remember going back, doing a story. Uh, I asked Jerry, Jerry, did you ever waver? Did you think the five million wouldn't come in? He said, no, I knew it was coming in. So I went to his wife, Maisel. Maisel, sitting around the table, did Jerry ever question whether it comes? She said, he always knew it was coming in. He had faith to believe that God would do something great, and God did something great. All right, to advance, the third one, notice, to let the oppressed go free. So in Isaiah 58, you fast what? You fast for evangelism. The great revival of 1859 called the Prayer Revival. A movement swept across America right before the Civil War. Men all over America would go to the closest church on Fridays and pray and not eat. All over America, men working in those days. Most women didn't go to work. Men, would, before the 12 o'clock whistle would grow, they'd leave their jobs, run, fall into a church, fall down, and begin praying out loud. They would not eat breakfast, not eat lunch, not eat dinner. They began to pray. And God did a miracle in what is called the Layman's Prayer Revival. It was in the New York Times, all over the place, how God worked miraculous because uh, men began to pray. Many of the men who lost their lives in the Civil War that followed were saved during those great prayer revivals, all right, to solve inner problems, that you break every yoke that you have, to provide for physical needs. Now, notice this, this fifth thing of this one. Is it not to share your bread? You give up your bread to give it to others to bring your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked that you cover them, you don't hide yourself. He said, sometimes you give up to give to others. And so I have a thing. I have a certain, certain poor folks at Thomas Road I give to. And no one knows it, but they know it. And so I put aside, when I, I fast, I put aside a certain amount, Lord, I'm not gonna eat today. How much would I want? I would spend one or $200. And so I put that money aside, and I walk up to somebody at Thomas Road. I know they are needy. I know that they work at a job way down the wage limit, and I give them the money. I'm fasting, but I don't want to make money off of fasting by getting money because I didn't eat money. I didn't spend it on my fast, so I give it to them. Number six, next, number six at the bottom. Notice what it says. Then your light shall break forth light. I fast about decision-making. I fa the biggest book I've ever written is called Fasting for Spiritual Breakthrough. I fasted for that book and through that book, and um, it sold about 550,000 copies, about a half a million copies. And I fasted about problems. I fasted about hiring people. And then notice the next one. Um, your health shall spring forth speedily. You fast for healing. I've told you about 
fasting. I could tell you story after story. And Thomas wrote how we fasted, and God lays people, God heals people. You fast for your testimony, your righteousness. None of us has righteousness. It's God's righteousness. I fast for my testimony to impact the world. And the last one, protection. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear. When you fast, God says, I'll give you a rear guard. The word, the Hebrew word for rear guard is the Shekinah that came behind Israel in the wilderness when Egypt was chasing them and protected them. God can protect you. If you need protection from Satan, ask God to protect you when you fast. How to begin fasting? Ask God to lead you in your fast. God, show me what I'm going to do. And um, we've already looked at that verse before. When you fast, be not of a sad countenance. Anoint your head, wash your face. Sometimes you fast in private. There have been times I'm fasting and no one knows about it. My wife would say to me, I'm fasting, so can you fix your own meals this day? Yes. Other times I'd say, I'm fasting, don't fix any meals for us. And so a private fast, but then there's a public. When you join, ask everyone in the church to join us. I'm asking you to pray and fast for 40 days for America. Write out your purpose. Write out your plan. Write in my prayer list, I write what I'm fasting for. Lord, I'm going to begin on Friday. Some of you will begin on Wednesday, and you'll begin on Wednesday and go for 40 days and end up November the 1st, Sunday before election. I'm going to begin on Friday. I'm going to fast two meals a day, and I'll end up on election day, and I won't eat until election day. Eat a light snack before sundown, before you start the fast. Put a little bit into your stomach, a little bit into your system. Dedicate your time for meals, for prayer. Bring your Bible, bring your book, and then bring all those to God. Here is 40 days of fasting. It, Pastor, is there a copy here for everyone? You think so? Okay, there's a copy here. Folks, you can see up there. You can read it on your iPhone. You can get it. Download it's free. You can get it on your, iP on your computer. You can get it on your iPad. And you can have daily devotions. I want you to know, you're joining in. Several denominations have taken this booklet, and they are sending it to all of their people, asking them to pray and fast for 40 days. Folks, if God's people in America will fast and pray, we can make a difference in this coming election. It's not about politics. It's not about getting on television. It's not about what we're going to do. It's, it's about God. What does God want to do? Is God finished with America? Is God finished with America? If we don't pray, we're saying, God, you must be finished. I won't waste my time. But if you believe God is not finished with America, I don't believe he has. God never gives up until people give up. So, folks, let's pray and fast and ask God to do something. Will you bow, together, bow your heads with me in prayer? As we bow in prayer, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask that you pray to God. Lord, I've heard a sermon. Lord, I've heard an appeal. What must I do? I want you to commit yourself. Will you fast, yes or no? It's called a vow. My vow, Lord, is not to the preacher, not to Grand Strand Baptist Church, not to towns, my, vast, my vow, Lord, is to you. I'm promising to you, Lord, for 40 days, I will eat just one meal a day. Or, Lord, I'll go on a 40-day juice and water fast. Lord, I'll eat two meals a day. And some of you, there may be a health problem, and you have to eat certain kinds of food. And so for 40 days, Lord, I'll not take any coffee, or I'll not drink any tea. Lord, I'll just eat the healthy food I have to eat to keep alive. Do you make that prayer to God right now? Dear Jesus, you know my commitment. I'm going to eat one big meal a day for 40 days. Only one. I'm going to pray twice a day. I'll spend my time praying, Lord, for America. It's about America, Lord. I love America. 
I was born here. It's been good to me. God bless America. God save America. God keep America safe. I pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Preacher. It's hard to package all the all the years that Dr. Towns has been standing in the trenches. He's been on the front lines. He's been in the foxholes. And uh, I remember those days early when Liberty first started and unbelievable amounts of money needed to be raised. And for a city of, at that time, maybe 50,000 people with a church that had a ministry that was on more TV sets than any other network program in the world. It's amazing what God did. God is still in the soul-saving ministry, business. God is still on the throne. So I'll, I'll cleave to come, and I'll tell you, just play the organ, and we're going to have this time of invitation because, one, that that I do in my head is something that I do, and I have every intention and all the well-meaning that anyone could have. But I've got to move my decisions from my head to my heart. And those things that I believe in my heart, then I can purpose to fulfill the decision. But if all I do is give a mental decision, and I don't realize or stop long enough to think the opposition that will be raised up against it, are the struggles and difficulties that will surround me, then I sometimes lose. And so we don't want to lose this battle. The devil's not pleased. He's not happy. He knows that the most powerful thing that any believer can do is pray and fast. He has no defense for it. He just distracts. So would you bow your heads with me, and Cleve's going to begin playing softly. And I just want to invite you, if you'd like, those petitions that, that um, Dr. Sounds talked about, addictions and other devices Satan uses, I want to encourage you to come and pray. If it's salvation of a loved one, a family member, a friend that you've been praying for years for, and during this time, this season of prayer, for 40 days, the names on the prayer list that you'll receive as we dismiss. You want to come and pray. That's moving your decision from your head down to your heart. And say, God, I'm giving this to you today. I need this breakthrough. I need this miracle. I need it in my life personally. I want to witness it in the life of my family. God, I need you. Our country, Lord, we need you. And so you have that burden. You can make a place by your seat if you'd like. You don't have to come to the altar. But certainly, we need to be people of prayer in these moments that are before us. God, I make this surrender. I'll support these 40 days and I'll be praying every day I'll seek you I'll follow you would you all please stand with me let's stand together continuing our attitude of worship attitude of prayer maybe this morning you've got that family member that's heavy on your heart and if that's the case, would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, I do have a burden. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Maybe it's our country. Maybe you'd say, Preacher, I am, I am burdened over this election. And I know prayer can make a difference. If so, lift your hand wherever you are. Wherever you are. And we talk about supporting the 40 days of prayer. That starts on Saturday. And you can come here for the simulcast. I believe it's going to be online as well. And that's from 12 to 3. Also, our individual commitments, those that we make. 
And sometimes they're hard. And sometimes they're not. This may be a hard one. But as God leads you, if you go and will support praying during this 40 days as proclaimed, maybe you have a health issue that you can't commit to fast or a partial fast, but you'll support these 40 days and you'll find time every day to pray and to pray for a return. That's the whole theme, back to God. Would you lift your hand wherever you are? God bless you. God bless you. You're basically saying, I want America back. We can do all the campaigning in the world. But until we settle it in our soul and we say, yes, Lord, I believe you the answer. You're our only hope. And God, I'm committing my life in these next 40 days starting, starting on Saturday or Friday, rather, to see you work and move. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we have been challenged to do today. The call's been given. Now it's our responsibility to call others to join us, realizing this is not totally on the shoulders of Dr. Elma Towns. It's now on our shoulders. Because you burdened him. You spoke to his heart. And Lord, he came from Lynchburg to be here on this particular Sunday to share with us the experiences he's had with you and the difference that fasting has made in his life and in the lives of so many others. And so, Lord, we today take very soberly seriously earnestly making a decision that we purpose that we purpose to be observant during this 40 day time period that's being set apart we praise you for the greatest greatest gift of all and that's the Lord Jesus. And for the man, woman, boy, or girl who's watching by way of the web or who's in the service, who may not know you as his or her th their Savior, Lord, I pray today the door to their heart would open. And they would ask you to come into their heart and forgive their sins and save their soul. Lord, we know it is the prayer you answer. It's the prayer you hear. And we know it's the prayer you've obligated yourself to honor. And so for those who call on you this morning to save their soul, we rejoice to know that you've answered and that salvation's a reality for them. Now we pray you might bless them to have faith, test it, faith to tell somebody, hey, I've asked Jesus in my heart. He is now my Savior. Heaven is now my home. And then, Father, we pray for those that are committing to see things torn down, broken up, strongholds removed. Whether it's the Sickness, regardless of the disease, whether it's cancer, whatever. Lord, we plead your blood over every request that's on the hearts of every member, every person listening today by way of the web. God, I just pray those strongholds will be torn down during these 40 days. And that we can soon begin celebrating the victory where lives are being restored and needs are being met and lives are being changed. Lord, we do stand in need of that miracle. And God, we do pray 
that at the outcome of this election, things like abortion will no longer be legalized. And all these other issues that face the closing of the church in some cities and all the other warfare that's been declared on you, whether it's a monument in which your name is inscribed or whether it's a textbook in which it just simply says, in God we trust, or to take it from our money, or to remove it from our pledge. Father, we pray that we might see that return. Returning to the faith of our fathers, the faith of our founders. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.